black stuff, this soy sauce. That's a drug, right? Just tell me what this stuff is, John. The effects don't last that long. The side effects don't last that long. The effects will last the rest of my life, I think. Why don't you tell me, tell me about your friend John? I mean, that stuff, Dave. I'm remembering things that haven't happened yet. See, I don't really understand how I can walk out of a movie enjoying it as much as I did this film and then turn around to see everyone else going, well, you know, I think that maybe it was just made for a different audience. I think it was too surreal. Somebody actually said, this is like Tim and Eric's meets a horror movie. I was like, you know what? You're the motherfucker who's going to die at the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) You're the motherfucker who's going to be sentenced to the seventh layer, the seventh ring of, of damnation, which is having to watch Tim and Eric's billion dollar movie a billion times. Please don't compare anything to Tim and Eric. Because there is nothing as quite as corn and peanut filled as that lump of shit. This and is very certainly true. Certainly not a movie that's as as smart, while still abstract, mind you, mm-hmm. abstract where it makes sense. Right. As John dies at the end. Whoa, it's, whoa, dude! What? Fucking spoiler much? No, but of course that's the title of the film. You just told me John dies at the end. And maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. <laughs> no, I've seen it, of course. But yes, it's... Uh, oh, and for the record, I am this is Cyrus, and I'm joined by Brian Salisbury, for all of you out there who like to ask, who's that other guy? Who's the new guy? You know, this guy's been recording regularly on the site for a couple months now? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm Brian, and I've been here for a while, but here I am again. Keep up, people. Yes, keep up. Try, try and keep up. Uh, so yes, we're here to talk about John Dies at the End, which, of course, was one of the movies playing South by Southwest, which... I'm not sure either of us are really torn up inside that South by Southwest is finally over. I am the opposite of torn up inside. <laughs> I am starting to heal inside. Exactly. <laughs> it, it did kind of ravish us, ravage us a little bit, so uh, we're, we're happy that it's over. But yes, John dies at the end, which is, of course, directed by the great, the legendary Don Coscarelli. Which, of course, depends on how you define those words. There, I'm sure there's some I define like, them as great and legendary, Cyrus. I, I'm sure there's some people out there who go, look at his film... Uh, you know, list his filmography and go, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I <laughs> and, will look at it. Phantasm, Bubba Hotep, Beastmaster, uh, suck it. I, I'm with you. I, he is a, he, it's hard to describe him because he has an odd place in the history of like B and horror cinema mm-hmm. and that he's always been sort of outside of the circle, even of those regular guys. Films like Phantasm, for in- instance, is so utterly creative and bizarre yeah. that it's hard to put it in the same even in category of flat out horror, you're mm-hmm. like, I remember the first time seeing it going, is this a comedy? Well, you know what it feels like? It feels like a lost Argento film in a lot of ways. Like, it's yeah. just got that very weird dreamlike quality, and yet it does have comedic elements. And Beastmaster, which defined for the world pretty much the, the, the post apocalyptic fantasy genre, right. you know, brought Mark Singer's career briefly to, to light. People knew who he was for like a week. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, there was V. Come on. To be oh, honest. I'm sorry. Yes, we can't forget about V. <laughs> How could I possibly forget about the gerbil munching atrocity that was V? Uh, and, but uh, Don Coscarelli, like I said, he, what was the other one? Oh, uh, Bubba Hotep, which yeah. was sort of a. I mean, that was Latter Day and was a return for Bruce Campbell, and it was one of those films that brought him to the attention of a lot of people for the first time. Not Bruce Campbell, but Don Coscarelli. Uh-huh. It was a bizarre little horror comedy. It was yeah. One of those things you would really don't expect. It, it wasn't like a meta horror comedy or any level, anything like that. I mean, it was based on a very original and an odd story to begin with, who I believe was Joe Lansdale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it was Joe Lansdale. Who, who is known for writing very original and offbeat horror. This is true. And now, with John Dies at the End, uh, his latest film, he's once again basing on Don Coscarelli coming from a really strange source material, uh, the book John Dies at the End, which is uh, written by one of the editors at Crack.com, who goes by the pseudonym David Wong, Mm -hmm. that was very popular originally as a web serial and then eventually put together as a paperback. It's, you know... Meta doesn't isn't the right word once again for this either. There is no real accurate way to say here's where it fits into the popular definitions of mm-hmm. society's canon, what have you. Yeah. Um, I described it online as saying it's as if a young David Cronenberg directed a comedy episode of the show Supernatural. Right. And that's exactly how that's I, not bad. Except I have to add as an addendum, someone else pointed this out to me. 
uh, that was written by Douglas Adams. Yes, no, it's <laughs> it's all over the place, and and it very Douglas Adams. In fact, I feel like that had to have been an influence on David Wong writing this because it does go to the like outer limits of absurdity at times. But I think what it is is that it takes a lot of. It's not that it's meta. It just takes a lot of creative leaps with the narrative, and it doesn't conform itself to you know normal rules of storytelling. And I think that's kind of what I like the most about it is, I mean, I guess uh, we should kind of, I, I'm going to try and explain a little bit of the story here. Yeah, it's hard to say too much without giving away really fun surprises that happen along the way, but by all means, see, okay. let's, let's let's challenge Brian. <laughs> yes, yep. this is a challenge. I feel like I'm on the hot seat now. Uh, yeah, basically you have these two guys who are paranormal, not even investigators necessarily, not really exorcists, not just investigators, somewhere in, in the middle of that continuum is where they exist. Uh, their job is basically to deal with weird supernatural shit, which they have uh, been made aware of, of being around us all the time because they are on a drug called the sauce uh, or soy sauce. And it basically makes them aware of the presences that do surround us. And so they, they go out and they deal with it. And the movie opens with basically the, the main character, Dave, explaining to a reporter exactly how it is that he and his friend John were able to avert the apocalypse and, you know, of course, the reporter is very dubious. The reporter is played by uh, Paul Giamatti, who, once again, is great. I mean, I haven't really... Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a movie where he wasn't at least great. Like, even if the movie wasn't great. Uh, so, yeah, he's explaining the whole thing and laying it out there. And they're... Uh, it's like... It's kind of like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, where, like, the narrative jumps all over the place because the guy's like, Oh, and I need to tell you this part as well. Oh, and I need to tell you this. Oh, and we need to explain this. And it's just, like, it's it's all over the place. Well, and you've got, like, a, all right, so this actor, Chase Williamson, who plays Dave, who is telling Paul Giamatti the story in a diner. And Paul Giamatti, as a reporter, uh, played Arnie Bl- Blondstone, is, doesn't believe a word of it at first, but... Dave is able to prove very quickly that for he has some sort of power or ability. Yes. And so as the story goes on, Arnie is drawn more and more into it and and you know, it's it's a you know, a princess bride situation except with an adult. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's very much like that. It's 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 basically that uh Paul Giamatti's character is the sick Fred Savage. <laughs> yes, that's exact no way it's not like that at all. But anyway. <laughs> uh, uh you know, you've described, I think, as much of the plot as I'm comfortable really laying out yeah. flat out. I mean, I love the fact, for instance, that uh, it does feel like it's the first chapter in a series of films in many ways. Which yeah. It doesn't have to be. I mean, no. it cuts off, you've got a complete story, you should be totally It's self-contained, but, but you feel like it, there's enough there, there's enough canon there that it could keep going. Yeah, episode one of yeah. the adventures. Uh, and yet the title is also accurate and inaccurate at the same time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, that's one of those levels that this is, like, gets very Cronenbergian. Like, you have to be able to wrap your mind around some abstract concepts, but not one so surreal as to not make sense either. It's re- Yeah, it, it really sounds like we're speaking in, in vagities, uh, and it's not that... It's not that the movie doesn't explain itself, and it's not that you're going to be sitting there going, what the fuck did I just watch? It does It does tell a complete story, but it does so in ways that take you to very weird universes. And you're either kind of on board with it as it's going along, as it makes these rapid changes, or you're not. And I think that's what it's going to come down to with people, even fans of Coscarelli, I think, are, are either going to be on board with all the crazy places to which it goes, or they're not. Yeah, well, they, it, it does seem to, from the, if you're not paying attention, it will seem like it's jumping around a lot. And the truth is, like I said, I found that being, I was sitting there very focused, not drinking beer, which helps a lot. This yes. is not a beer drinking movie. No, it movie. is not. No. <laughs> this may be a pot smoking movie, but not a beer drinking movie. Possibly LSD, we're not sure. I don't want to kill anyone, so let's not recommend that. Well, I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying <laughs> that possibly this is the kind of movie that would lend itself to that drug usage. No, do not take LSD, we're not, they're not advocating that. No, I'm saying to this movie specifically. <laughs> LSD can't kill you by itself, but with this movie, it possibly could actually kill you. What's Good. I'm glad. I'm glad our morals or our moral compass is facing due north. I yeah. love it. No, come on. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. I don't care. Do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 
Ah, oh, there are so many moments. Like I can't believe I didn't think of Douglas Adams right off the bat because there are so many moments that when it does go sort of off plot completely for a moment and becomes very almost sort of humorously navel gazing, it resembles mm-hmm. nothing so much as some of the soliloquies of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy right. and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where it's basically explaining to the audience like these very finite points of its own mythology. Yes, where it's like it's like oh well that. You know how that monster works. It's like blah 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 blah, and it it does it. that. That specifically felt like Hitchhiker's Guide to me, where it's like they had to stop for a second and explain to you this alien race that you were seeing. Yeah, and then at the same time, you've got that supernatural element with the two young, good-looking guys who who is who are you know this is episode zero as they're learning how to deal with the supernatural and what in fact comprises it here, which is really more of a super dimensional than supernatural sort of thing that they're they're dealing with on a regular basis. And there's so many interesting characters who've fallen along the way. Like you've got Clancy Brown mm-hmm. as Dr. Albert Marconi, who is sort of like the guy who is the ultimate badass at doing what we know they end up eventually. He's like doing. a TV psychic to the nth degree. Like he's got his own temple in Vegas kind of a thing. Yeah, it's one of those things like one point something's like, oh, that hack? It's like, watch what you say, man. That guy is a fucking amazing. Yeah, that that guy's a beast. (laughs) And it makes it even better that it's Clancy Brown, who is in fact like, you know, a beast. He's right. awesome. That guy's yeah. a fantastic genre actor. Uh, you got Doug Jones as one of the beings who may or may not be from another dimension, who is multi ant, who is doesn't never appeared like he was from this dimension to begin with, even without makeup. You've yeah. got Angus Grimm, the tall man from the Phantasm series, who yeah. makes a small appearance. And in I here. do want to throw out a special notice to uh, Glenn Turman, who plays a detective who's constantly kind of hounding the two guys, and then at the same time trying to figure out what else is going on. Glenn Turman is the star of one of my favorite black exploitation movies, JD's Revenge. Oh. So uh, I would like to throw him a little extra love as well. Yeah, I thought he was excellent. I did not know about that film. Yeah. It's a great film. If you ever get a chance to track it down, JD's Revenge is uh, it's an awesome black exploitation horror film. So, but I, I don't know what else there is to say about the John dies at the end without giving away too. Well, much. I will say this: what grabs you right at the beginning is the razor sharp dialogue. There are so many jokes batted about at breakneck speed. That it's kind of hard to catch your breath at times because, and you're laughing mostly not even at like pratfalls or gimmicky jokes, but just at what's being said both in the moment and in voiceover. Mm. And it was to me like that was my favorite part of the whole movie was, you know, the first 15, 20 minutes when it was just Paul Giamatti and Chase Williamson batting stuff back and forth. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, I, I agree with you. In fact, they're like the there's so many neat sight gags too that sound mm-hmm. silly on paper, but Coscarelli met, found a way to really make them work. Like very early on in the movie, they confront a monster that forms itself off off, off of all the cold cuts that are in this woman's freezer in her yep. basement. So it's this shambling, rather scary monster made out of like rack of lamb and sausage links. And yeah, and they as they're confronting this thing, they're like it. They realize they've it's mistaken them for uh, Marconi for, for Marconi Clancy Brown's character, and they're like, "Hey, what the fuck, man? Do we look like we're in our sixties? Here, hold on." And so they give the guy the monster their cell phone. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, "Here, you talk to him." <laughs> yeah, and it, that I love that segment because that monster is so well designed, and it's mostly practical effects. And it reminded me so much of that scene from Dead Heat. Where they're in the butcher shop and like all of the meat starts, you know, being zombified and coming back to life, and it was you oh, and Dead Heat. I love Dead Heat. I don't even care. You are the guy. I am the guy. Me and Kayla Cromer, I think, are the only people on the planet that like Dead Heat. <laughs> uh, as there, as well, there's a lot of just straight science fiction in here. It's really yeah. funny. Now, if there's a thing I didn't like about this film, mm-hmm. it felt like a lot of the effects were unfinished, especially as we got towards the end, yeah. and some of the stuff that was more CG ish was a little. It needed a final polish. Its low budget seam starts to show toward the end. I think is what happens. But yeah, I, I, I'm with you. There's there's some effects at the end that I was and they were, it was it sucked because those were the only moments where I was like, oh, that feels kind of cheap. Yeah. Everything else throughout the movie, I was completely on board with. But yeah, toward the end, it it did uh, did start to wear a little bit. Yeah. I, 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 it was disappointing because the the subject matter is so intense by that point, and mm-hmm. so almost at that point it's kind of Terry Gilliam esque mm-hmm. where they where the film is going, and I wanted to see more care taken with that other stuff. Like the practical effects are all so good, yeah. it was disappointing that that they looked at the CG and went, "No, nah, that's fine, that'll do." I was like, "Yeah, I don't think that will do." Actually, <laughs> that's, I mean, it was a pretty big mark against it for me. It looked like early Sci Fi Channel special effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, "What a shame, considering how well written it was." And yeah, I, I don't know. Like I said, just to come back around to this, 
uh, where I started, this film is not for everybody. No, and it's not. And it's funny, the way uh, Don Coscarelli mentioned during the Q&A, like how, how he came about being on this project was about as random and haphazard as you could possibly... Like, he was on Amazon, and he, one of the recommendations said, you might like this book. So he read it, and he's like, oh, I'd, I'll direct that. Huh. Like, that's that's how he came onto the project, was literally like... <laughs> Amazon recommended that he read this book. He read it and thought, wow, that would be a fun project. And so he directed the movie. Let me say for the record, lest anyone make any comparisons ever between you and Carlisle, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but just so they know there is no comparison, Brian himself conducted said Q&A and didn't feel fit like it was necessary to bring up. It's not, no, it's not germane. I mean, it's it's something he would have said, you know, to anyone who was hosting the Q&A who had asked, you know, about the origin, but it was, a, it was an honor because I'm a huge fan of the guy. So I was, I was geeking out a little bit up there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to recommend this to anybody who knows, like, if you've seen, if you've, if you've read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books more than once, if you have fall, fell in love with Bubba Hotep, mm-hmm. if you are a fan of films like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, yes. or, or uh, The Brood, or... Yeah, I think we've hit on, I think you've just hit on every single thing you need to appreciate in order to go, you know, going into this, know that you will like it. Yeah. Like, I think if you love all the things that you just mentioned, Cyrus, I think this is a movie for you. Like... I really don't think there's any question if you do love all of those things. And even though, like I said, I pretty big sense of distaste with how how off those effects were at the end, just because, like I said, I was enjoying it so 100% up until that point, mm-hmm. I, I still am going to give it a low full price. Nice. I just, a lot of affection for, a lot of affection for any film that is this ballsy and tries to do things this different and yet isn't just throwing everything on the screen and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to give it a high matinee, and only because I want to give it a full price, but I think it's the kind of movie that you you don't know, you can't be certain, even if you like all those things, you can't be 100% certain that it's going to be for you, yeah. and I feel like it is worth seeing in theaters, and in fact, I don't think it can be, I don't think you can replicate that experience at home, so I do think you need to see it in the theater, but, you know, maybe do it as a matinee, just in case you find out that it's not for you. It is very definition of a fun midnight movie. Yes. Like a, a cult film. I hope a lot of people who tend to like that sort of thing really do make a point of seeing this whenever, and hopefully if, mm-hmm. this comes to their towns. Like I said, this just played at South By. I'm not entirely sure that it's going to get distribution of any kind yet, because it is such a niche film. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's niche films, and then there's John Dies Again, <laughs> <laughs> which is like a niche within niche films. Yes. Uh, I, and fortunately, I happen to be situated very comfortably inside of that niche. As am I. Yes, absolutely. Now I'm going to drop my acid, and we're going to try this review again from the top. John dies at the end! Move. Now. I got my attention, Mr. Wong. Oh, it gets better. A lot better. 